All right. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for joining us today. Um, my name is Brandi Duffield, and I am the Specialist of Partnerships and Alumni here at the Accelerator Center. Um, first of all, just wanted to extend a big thank you to our sponsor, Bearskin and Par, for making this uh, event possible today. Um, very excited to be joined with Jason Hines, partner at Bearskin and Par. He will be here discussing everything you and your investors need to know about IP. Um, so if you have any questions, feel free to pose them in the chat function. And what we'll do is we'll sort of address those throughout the presentation. Um, and if you're comfortable, feel free to unmute yourself and, and ask your question that way as well. So without further ado, I'll hand it over to Jason. Thanks, Brandy. Hi, everyone. It's great to be here today. Um, this is a, obviously a picture of me on a, on a boat. So we're going to spend the next two hours looking at my travel photos and reminiscing about pandemic, uh, you know, life before the pandemic. Um, all, all kidding aside, you know, I, I, we wanted to sort of take the take a chance to share sort of more of a personal photo. We, we see a lot of lawyers in suits and, you know, there's another side to a lot of us these days. And I think we're seeing it through the pandemic. So it's nice to have something a little more personal, I think. So um, I'm, I'm here today. I'm a fairly informal person. So if you want to jump in with questions at any time or if you have things you want to talk about that we're sort of touching on or maybe you want to come back to in detail, please jump in with your question either through the chat or, or jump in with a sort of audio question as Brandy mentioned. Um, I've got a lot of slides to talk about. That doesn't mean that we're necessarily going to cover all of them in detail. And I think the goal here is to have a discussion. So I've got a bit of material to go through. And then I think we'll have a Q&A period at the end and we may come back to some case studies I've got sort of prepared that can give us some sort of examples of how some of the things we're talking about today were kind of applied in a real case or real situation that we've dealt with. Okay. So I'll, I'll get right into it then. The, the, you know, there, there really are sort of three main topics for today. Um, the first is kind of an overview of what is IP. And this is really meant to be a little bit of review, a little bit of refresher. Some people may know all, all this already, but I think it's helpful to understand because when we start talking about investors, we start talking about strategies for in, you know, attracting investors and keeping your investors happy. It's important to remember that there's a big focus on aligning the IP strategy with the business goals. So coming back to first principles and understanding why we have different types of IP and really what they cover will help you understand how they can plug into the business and what they're doing for the business. The second thing we're going to talk about is some of those strategies in particular. And we're going to be looking at, you know, some of the key factors to keep in mind, some of the key timing decisions, to, decisions around timing, decisions around location and, and so on. And also tying it back to the types of IP that we're looking at sort of in the first part. Um, and then we're going to talk about sort of common pitfalls. You know, what are some, some classic things to avoid? Are there certain things that, you know, we know from experience, these come up all the time at the startup or scale up stage, or there are common issues with, with investors that investors see as red flags or as, as potential deal breakers. And how do we avoid those? And how do we proactively sort of do the right things early on in your in your in your sort of corporate life to avoid you know, creating problems for yourself down the road? So the, the first thing, and this is again a little bit of review, but I think it's kind of helpful to understand the context of other things you're talking about. Is really this question of you know why do we have intellectual property what is it all about and the, the first thing i'll say is we have intellectual property because there's a limited amount of stuff that the earth has okay and what that does in practice is it creates this natural scarcity so there's a limited amount of land limited amount of minerals and water and so on and that natural scarcity creates the ability to uh, monetize that so if something is naturally scarce then there's a natural value associated with how scarce that thing is OK, and we have property laws that deal with that. So normal property law deals with how things are scarce and, you know, whether it's ownership of a house, ownership of a stapler, you know, personal property, real estate, that kind of thing. There's a whole series of laws that have evolved over time to deal with those. But how do we deal with a situation where there's no natural scarcity? And so when you have something that's um, uh, abstract or ethereal or conceptual, like an idea or a brand, that doesn't have sort of physical presence, how do we deal with that? So the solution is largely intellectual property. And it used to be called or has been called at times industrial property. And it has its roots kind of in the industrial revolution in the 1800s and the early 19th century. But really the idea here is that you're taking something that is 
not naturally scarce, so a new idea or a brand, and you're creating a legal fence around it, and you're creating this artificial scarcity in the same way that natural scarcity exists for things like real estate or personal property. So it could be a new idea, it could be a new pharmaceutical product, it could be a new application for a smartphone, it could be a new brand, you've got a new, you know, new, new design um, for a particular product or a new type of uh, product, a new company. It could be something creative, you know, a, a, a book, a movie, something expressive. And that includes, by the way, source code that does fall within the category of creative expression. And the, the supply and demand curve tells us that when you increase the scarcity of something, what you're doing is increasing the value. So fundamental, you know, starting from why do we have IP and why do investors care about IP? It's about this scarcity. It's about increasing the value in a company, increasing the cost of a product, increasing the, the margin on a product by virtue of the fact that there's some artificial scarcity created through either a patent, a trademark, or some sort of copyright protection or some other type of IP. Okay. And there are, there are three big ones that we often talk about, and there's a couple others we'll touch on as well, but the big ones are, first of all, trademarks. And this is really about protecting the brand of a company. So Nike, Reebok, Apple, Coca-Cola, the, the source of the goods, the, the person or the corporate entity that is selling the product or providing the service. Copyright, again, another very famous type of intellectual property. And this is all about protecting the expression. So you've written a book, you've created a movie, you've got something with maybe a creative expression to it, whether it's code or paintings, um, you develop, you've taken photographs, those kinds of things lend themselves towards protection through the copyright regime because they are tied to some form of particular expression. And the third one, and often sort of considered to be the nuclear option because it's the most powerful, is the ability to protect an idea through a patent. So this could be, like I said, a new pharmaceutical product, it could be a new mechanical device, a new machine, could be a new drug delivery system, could be a new anything. But the idea itself is the thing that's patented. So it's not, not necessarily the particular form of the expression. It's not necessarily what it looks like, but more or less what it actually does. So let's talk about these briefly um, for a couple of minutes, and then we can sort of tie them into this IP strategy in the next section. So uh, fundamentally, a trademark is about a symbol, and it's a symbol that distinguishes what you're selling, your goods or your services, whatever you're offering, from the goods and services of other folks. So Nike is selling shoes under the Nike brand. Reebok is selling shoes under the Reebok brand. They're separate corporate entities. They have separate structures. And the consumer, the person who's purchasing the product, wants to know where their stuff is coming from. So the symbols that we attach to the product the websites to the companies themselves are identifiers of source of goods. So where these goods and services are coming from. And it can be as simple as a word, a word like Kodak. The word could have some design elements to it. So the Kodak design, it could be a slogan like got milk. So something a little more creative, a little more expressive. It could be a naked design, the, the Nike swoosh by itself. So these are just some of the examples of successful trademark applications or trademarks. Um, that exist and serve as these symbols. Other things, sort of the non-traditional types of trademarks are things like the shape of the Coca-Cola bottle, uh, the shape of Toblerone, the actual chocolate bar, and as well as the packaging for the Toblerone chocolate bar. We also see now trademark registrations coming in for things like particular colors. So the color pink associated with insulation, the color green for John Deere in association with you know, lawnmowers and so on, um, but also things like smells. You might have motor oil that smells like bubble gum. If you are identifying a product or a particular source of a product using some of these indicators, you know, sight, sound, smells, these can all be trademarks. There's a big difference, though, or a big limitation on what trademark rights can do for you. As you know, Nike and Reebok both sell shoes. And what's important to remember is when we talk about trademark law, you're not talking about exclusive control over a particular product. You're talking about control over the source of the product. So there's no ability with, with trademark rights to limit the scope of what somebody is selling. You can control how they brand it. You can control what they name it, or what they call it. Those are all fair game for trademark disputes and for trademark you know, uh, interactions with your competitors, but you ultimately can't control what they end up selling. 
Oh, I noticed there's a comment. I'm sharing the presenter view. So let me switch to that. Thanks for the note about that. There's nothing secret there. So uh, let me just switch the share to let me see if that makes sense. Is that better? That's perfect, Jason. Thank you. Great, thanks. Sorry about that. I thought I tested it before, but obviously not. I'm only a year into the pandemic. And I'm still learning how to use Zoom, so that's uh, not a good, perhaps not a good sign. But I'll do my best. Um, okay, so we were talking about trademarks and their their limits on protecting the scope of goods. Do trademarks matter? Absolutely. I mean, if you look at this screen, what you'll see is very famous trademarks. In fact, some of them are just fragments of trademarks, like the D for Disney, the B for Johnson & Johnson, the S from Sega, the K from Kellogg. Even just a fragment of a trademark can actually be incredibly powerful because it provides a clear indication of the source of goods. And why does that matter? It matters because your customers want to know that they're buying from you. There are certain expectations about pricing, about quality, about the type of goods that they're going to be getting, perhaps what they're made of, how they're manufactured, where they're manufactured, are they manufactured using fair trade principles and so on. So the, the trademarks themselves can have incredible value for a company. Okay, let's switch over. Any, any questions about trademarks before we move on? Okay, great. Let's talk briefly about copyright and just contrast that with trademarks a little bit. So copyright is about protecting the form of expression. So as you may know, it's not about a particular brand, but about the exclusive right to copy an original work. So whether it's a piece of literature, like a book or some music or artwork, uh, it could be software, uh, both the source code and machine code. These are things that can be protected by the, the rules that are provided in the copyright system. And in fact, these are some of the longest lasting terms. So copyright now can last in some cases 70 years plus the life of the author or even longer. So it can be an incredibly long time for something to be protected by copyright. What are the big limits of copyright? Well, it's limited to protecting, making copies of the actual thing. So it doesn't protect you from the functional aspects that are described or shown. And why does that matter? Well, it matters because if your copyright is in your code, I have no restrictions on my ability to read your code take the ideas and the functions that are described in that code and then writing my own code that does exactly the same thing. As long as I don't copy the particular form of the expression, this is really about form over substance, I'm entitled to take the ideas. And I often use this example, you know, I could read a book about welding techniques, take all of the information in there, go out and, and conduct some welding, I could go and write my own book, I could present a class, all of those things would be permissible because the ideas themselves are not protected by copyright. It's only those types of, it's only the particular expression. So the text, the images, you know, maybe some flow charts or whatever I'm showing, but those things alone are the things that are going to be protected. And we often see an intersection between this when we start talking to investors because they sometimes don't understand or blur the line between patents and, 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 and copyright, particularly vis-a-vis -vis software. So Understanding where the difference is from your perspective and help you better understand and better explain it to investors where the differences are and where the limits are. It also helps explain why there's such an emphasis put on getting software patents and why software patents can be so valuable. So let's talk about those for a second. And here's a, an example I like to look at. It's this is a gravity powered shoe air conditioner. There were over 10 million issued patents right now. Um, obviously, most of them are a lot more useful and not quite as frivolous as this, but this is a memorable example that I like to bring up. The basic idea here is you've got some sort of bladder inside the shoe, and as the person walks, they move cooling fluid through the bladder and down into a compressor unit that's actually in the heel, and that actually bleeds the heat off of the foot, theoretically cooling the person's shoe off. Does this actually work? I have no idea. I've never actually seen one. Um, it's probably incredibly cumbersome, but it's a neat idea, and it's something that, you know, it's kind of fun to think about. The key thing, though, to remember from this is that it's, it's not the particular shoe, and it's not the particular drawing you see it's protected. It's about the idea, about how to do something useful, how to solve some problem, a te technical problem, like how do you keep your, your feet cool in the summer? So coming up with an idea about putting an air conditioner unit into a shoe solves that problem. 
And it's the idea, the combination of those concepts that goes towards uh, the patentability of an, of, of, an, of an invention. So it's the functional aspect. And if we come back to things like trademark law, where you're just protecting the brand and Nike and Reebok can sell the same shoes or copyright where I can literally read your code and copy it as long as I don't make an exact copy, as long as I write it in my own words. Patents are the nuclear option because they do provide you with that functional protection. They protect the underlying idea. So I can't copy the idea. I can't sell the same product if it's protected by a patent. And this is true whether or not you've actually developed the product independently. So two competitors who are working in the same space, if one of them has a patent and the other independently develops the same idea a year later, the first person to file for the patent and get the patent is able to control the market and is able to keep that other person from practicing their invention. So you can understand, I think, why they start to become so powerful because if Nike could stop Reebok from selling shoes, that would be incredibly valuable to the market for a particular type of shoe that customers want all of a sudden the scarcity goes up and what does that do to the valuation? That means the valuation goes up. It means the value of that product goes up, the margins go up and hopefully the return on the investment goes up. Jason, I believe uh, Ash has a quick question. Hi Ash. Yes, hi Jason, thank you very much. I've got a question about that because as you probably know better than all of us, when sometimes when new technology comes out, the, 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 the one who's quick and, and gets that patent in early and defines it properly kind of puts in a definition of that technology that is so broad and all encompassing that yep. anyone who comes in after that with an idea that hasn't been thought of but is leveraging the technology is almost locked down. Is, is, is it as simple as that or you know, that's what I, how I'm interpreting it, right? Because, you know, in our perspective, blockchain technology, and you can do a lot of things with it, but there are new fresh ideas on how to use that technology. But if someone's described the capability of the technology, does that cover the new idea of its use? Yeah, it's a great question. And, the, you know, I'll give you the classic lawyer answer, yes and no. Um, Keep in mind, I get paid by the hour, so the longer I talk, the more money we make. The, 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 all, all kidding aside, it's a complicated answer because you're touching on some things that are absolutely correct. The general principle is the first person to file is going to discover that there is very little objection or very little standing in the way of them getting broad patent protection. So if you come up with a broad concept for something, um, on my, my wall behind me, I've got the, the Edison light bulb patent, and I use this as an example. Um, if you come up with the basic idea for the light bulb, which is some filament in some, some sort of, sort of enclosed container, and you provide current through that and it eliminates, it illuminates the room, you could potentially get a very, very broad patent and make it very difficult for your competitors to come along and sell products. Um, what's interesting about the Edison patent though, is Edison didn't actually invent the light bulb. He invented an improvement to it. So what he found was, kind of what you're talking about, which was the improvement over the base technology. So the basic idea, yes, it's there, but you can build off of that and find the commercially valuable one. So oftentimes those early patents are, are roadblocks in the sense that they do try to cover a lot of territory, but they may not lead to a commercially viable product, right? There might be some key piece missing. And in Edison's case, for example, he was able to figure out the, the combination of an enclosed glass bulb with a vacuum with the right type of filament was where the combination of features that let you get to a, a light bulb that had a reasonable shelf life and a reasonable cost. And so you can actually sell a product now. Those early patents can be a problem though, right? If, they're, if they are really broad and they really cover off some of the territory, coming in later to the game, it can be very difficult to, to avoid infringing those, those uh, issues. It was the same, by the way, you know, you know, 150 years ago with the sewing machine. You know, there was a whole number of people working on basic technology related to the sewing machine. And some of the early folks had really broad patents on machines that ultimately wouldn't work, but they had these concepts kind of covered. And what ended up happening was a bunch of the other folks that were inventors got together and created a conglomerate or a patent pool. And they were able to effectively license the technology at a reasonable rate. And that ultimately led to um, the commercially viable sewing machine. So 
it, it's a problem. Um, it's a problem today. It was a problem 150 years ago. The solution, I think, is um, rests on a couple of principles. One, the first gatekeeper for all of this is the patent office. And you know, in the mid '90s, you saw this was a huge problem with people filing for very, very broad software patents that were getting issued because the patent office was doing its searching on the basis of its own internal archives. But it's sort of like, you know, you're the first one to file a patent for software. The patent office goes into the filing cabinet to look for older technologies, and it's just empty because there's no. You're the first one to the, to the party. What they were supposed to be searching, what they should have been searching, was uh, all the journal articles, all the publications that were out there, other technologies that were actually in, in commercial use. And because they didn't do that, there, that created a lot of problems in the mid 90s. And by the way, a lot of the case law that came out of the mid 2000s was a direct response to some of these BS software cases that were issued kind of improperly. And the system kind of corrected itself a little bit. So the first line of defense, though, the first gatekeeper is making sure that the patent office provides a thorough review and, and looks beyond kind of its own, you know, its own windows and its own little box and looks outside because it'll find a lot of prior art that'll help it defeat those, those types of claims. Um, there are other strategic things that come into play. There are now greater abilities for third parties to challenge the rights of patents um, as they are issued. They are published before they are issued and you can, once they're issued and you can take a look at them and if somebody thinks that the patent is completely offside, you can actually, there's a, a challenge process called an inter partes review or a post grant review process for two different branches that you can use to directly challenge the patent really before it gets any legs. And, you know, you've had a lot of success with folks like Apple and, and Microsoft going after what I would call these really frivolous patents to try to pull them back. So um, that's a long winded answer, but I, I think I'm sort of touching on. So to summarize, your question is absolutely right, I and mean, it is a problem. It's a problem that's trying to figure itself out, but it's a problem we've had for over 150 years. So we're still going to have it in 20, 30 years, and it's just always that constant tension. Does that sort of answer your question, Ash? It does. Look, I, I think every situation, I guess, is unique, and what you're saying is you got to pursue it and see if it has legs, right? Yeah, like we'll talk about this in a couple of slides, but one of the big goals, you know, when you start talking about an IT strategy is what, what's out there? right am i am i the first one to the party and the answer is often no right it's nice to be early on but the reality is a lot of these core patents might have been followed by other folks that doesn't mean that there's not some great niches where you can have a really commercially viable product but also a very successful patent strategy that's going to give you some legs and you know at the end of the day we'll, we'll jump to this a slide in this in a minute but it's about making sure that your patent filings and your patent strategy kind of aligns with your business goals and uh, we'll, we'll come back to that on another slide and maybe dig into that in some more detail. Is that work? I appreciate good. it. Okay. That was a good question. Thanks. Uh, Jason, there's um, also, Rob is asking uh, for some examples on when someone should file a patent versus a trade secret, trade secrets. Yeah, great question. Um, I it, Actually, I'm going to jump ahead two slides and I'll go to that right now because that's a sort of good timing. So what about trade secrets? We'll come back to design patents because I know there's a question on that. So what about trade secrets? Um, trade secrets are kind of the opposite of patents in many respects. In order to get a patent, you have to provide a technical description of what your invention is. If you've been through the patent process before, you know that one of the first things that patent lawyers will do is they say, tell me everything you need to know to make your invention or to build your invention. And then they will prepare a document that explains how it works, you know, what it, what it looks like. Maybe there's some drawings how it's used, how it's put together, what it's good for, what it's, not, what it's not so good for. That document ultimately becomes a public document at some point during the process. And the, the, the patent system really is based on this bargain that you're going to create this public document in exchange for your monopoly. So if you wanna stop somebody from selling your idea, you have to give something in return. And what you're giving in return is a full and complete public description of what it is. So the trade-off is I'm going to get a monopoly, but in return, I've got to pay for that with this public disclosure. A trade secret is kind of exactly the opposite, right? The sort of the secret is in the name. You, you have to keep the thing as a secret for it to have commercial value. And so I have, you know, tongue in cheek, I have this sort of kernel's chicken in there on the, on the slide. If you can keep a particular way of doing something or a process 
as a secret or some piece of key information about how you manipulate data, for example. Uh, maybe you're using data to predict you know, trends in the stock market or trends in oil prices. If you're doing that using a proprietary algorithm and you can keep that secret, that can be incredibly valuable for a couple of reasons. First of all, as you can understand, you're not providing that public disclosure. So when you do provide that public disclosure through a patent document, understandably, you're teaching the world, including your competitors, how to make your product. Now, the theory under patent law is that you're going to get a monopoly for a period of time and you're going to be able to lock them out, but you're still giving away that information and hoping to get something returned. With a trade secret, you're never giving that information away. You're keeping that entire piece confidential. And what's nice about that is you, if you can maintain that secrecy, you know, there's no limit. Your competitors may never find out how you're doing it. Your competitors may never know what's in the recipe for the chicken. Um, and it can also be things that are not necessarily traditionally patentable. So, you know, you'll see this with information that may be commercial information. So information about um, customer information, um, technical details about a product or a process. So maybe it's a, it's a way of manufacturing a particular product or a proprietary algorithm for doing something. But it could also be financial information, things like pricing information, customer information. Um, and in, that could include compilations of public information. So things like lists of customers, uh, things where, you know, if you dug hard enough, you would find that information in the public space, but it took you a lot of effort to do that. And so you put together a list and you compiled it in a nice organized way that can have a lot of value to you. And it, by the way, would be valuable to your competitors. Um, I've given a presentation recently on sort of the differences between trade secrets and patents. And, and you know, this, this conversation I own could probably go on for at least an hour because there are different considerations to look at. So to answer Rob's question, you know, some of the big things to think about when you're picking between patents and trademarks is, well, first, can you keep it a secret, right? If you're selling a product into the marketplace and the moment it's sold, the secret is out, it's not going to work very well as a trade secret, okay? So if what you're providing, if what your company makes or sells is a retail product that's gonna end up in a store, and once you've got that product in your hands, once a third party buys that, they'll be able to figure out how to make it and how it's built and all of that stuff. Understandably, it's not going to survive very well with a trade secret because the secret is literally out of the bag. The secret has been disclosed. At the other end of the spectrum, you have what I would call classic process cases where you know, you're making something and maybe you're shipping a product to a store, but the process by which you make it is kept secret. One of the very famous examples comes from the glass making industry. And in the 14th century, sort of the precursor to what we have today in the patent system, the Venetian glass makers were very secretive about their processes for making glass. Right? We take glass for granted today as a commodity, but it was a very, very difficult to, thing to make and to make uh, smooth glass that didn't have a lot of artifacts and wasn't, wasn't very, you know, was strong, was durable, and was the right sort of size that you could use for windows. They were able to maintain a monopoly, not because they went involved and in, got involved in a patent system, but because they kept the process secret. You could buy a glass window and you still had no idea how the glass makers put it together and how they were able to get the glass so smooth and so clear. So if you can maintain something as a process that, you know, there's at the end of the day, the, the product or whatever sold or the service that's offered in the marketplace doesn't immediately give you the secret then that's something that really fits the bill for trade secrets. It really, it really manages to, to sort of meet that, that threshold. Um, and there are a lot of things in the middle. I mean, one of the things that we think of today a lot are, you know, you've got some system that, you know, some e-commerce platform or some other, you know, data communication system, maybe it's a cryptography system. Parts of it are going to be public, parts of it are going to be exposed, but there might be a black box that sits somewhere. And so data goes in, something wonderful happens, and then other data comes out. But the internal mechanism for doing the data processing, perhaps the efficient way that it's done, perhaps the way that it's done so quickly, you know, that can be done in a way where it can be kept as a secret. So there are ways of, um, you know, in between sort of the classic product and process example, you know, there may be things that fall within that middle area that might still be valuable from a trade secret perspective. In, in practice, what I find is, you know, for my clients, when we look at their technology space and what they're what they're what they're selling, 
some things will, will be patentable. We should definitely file a patent. It's going to be in your customer's hands in six months. Other things are more like trade secrets, and we sometimes make a decision to keep something as a trade secret for as long as we can, um, knowing that ultimately it may get out, but, but that's something to keep in mind. Um, I hope that's an okay answer, Rob. There's, there's a whole series of other considerations, like how efficiently can you maintain it as a secret? How many people are involved? You know, if you have to have 150 people working on something and they all have to know the formula to make it work, it's hard to police those people and, and eventually you, you have concerns that that information might leak out at some point. So um, those are all things to keep in mind. Any more questions on that? That's a really interesting topic. Okay, great. Um, let me come back to design. I'll just talk about those for two minutes and then we can move on to the IP strategy stuff. By the way, I know we have, I know we sort of talked about having a half an hour presentation, um, but Brandy and I spoke before the call and I've got more content. So I'll just kind of keep talking and we can jump in with questions and I'll try to answer those as best as I can. But, you know, there's lots of stuff we can talk about. So um, hopefully you guys are okay with that. Um, so let's go back to design because so I did sort of skip over that, that uh, section. We talked about patents and patents are about protecting the function of something. Design patents are kind of in between trademarks and patents. They're really about you have a commercial product like an iPod or even a Yoda doll and it's not really necessarily functional or like a pitcher of, of, uh, for milk or for, for water. It, it's, it certainly may have some function, but the cool bit isn't necessarily the function, right? A pitcher of water, no, you know, you're not inventing the pitcher, right? People have poured water out of containers for thousands of years, but you're coming up with a new design, a new shape, a new sort of aesthetically pleasing look and feel. So things like, you know, electronics that have a nice look to them, glassware, flatware, Toys. I mean, the Star Wars folks and the Lucas folks have been very aggressive about this since the early you know, days of Star Wars in the 70s, um, making sure they get design patents on all their toys. It's a really cost-effective way of covering off some key aspects of the technology. We're doing a lot of things in the design space right now for things like icons, for graphical displays. So you've got an app. The app has a particular layout. We're filing a design patent on that layout. Right? It's not about what it does, but it's about the user experience when they interact with that icon or that, that application. Um, the icons themselves, so individually, you know, different looking icons for different things. If you have an app for doing some particular function and there's a, there's a very unique icon that you've developed, that's not going to be patentable per se, the icon, but it might be something you could get a design patent through. Okay. Um, you often talk about these as well. They're often called design registrations. In Canada, we call them. Uh, in, the, in the U.S., they're design patents. In Canada, they're called the industrial design registrations. Um, and you talk about them as design registrations in Europe or European community to, com, European community design registrations. So um, there are different ways of talking about them, but they're all kind of the same thing. They're all tied to kind of the aesthetic look and feel of the device. And just for some context, you're typically looking at about 10% of the cost of a, uh, a full patent for a functional thing. So you can get a patent on perhaps, you know, the way that an iPod processes, you know, MP3 files to produce music. Um, and for about 10% of the cost, you can get a, a patent on the look and feel of a particular iPod. Any questions about designs? We can come back to these, but they're certainly a, a power. They're becoming a more and more powerful tool um, in, the, in the IP space, primarily because, you know, as we're moving into more software, you know, app stuff, being able to protect pieces of that has become more and more common. Okay, if there's no questions, I'll move on to the next uh, topic. We already talked about that. So let's jump over now to sort of IP strategies and talk about some of the, you know, we'll talk about sort of the, some of the different types of IP. Let's talk a little bit about how those work in the context of, okay, let's take the theory and now let's apply it to a business. And what are the things that you should be thinking about and frankly, what are the things that your investors and your, your folks that want to put money into the company are going to be thinking about and looking for? Um, the, the big one, and this is where I have to get involved with clients, is, is from the very beginning is understanding what's your strategy? And when we talk about IP, we've talked about some of the types. Do you have a strategy that's tied to your business goals? So the IP that you're looking to protect, are you doing it because you have a certain business goal in mind? Um, because you should be. You should be thinking about where do I want to go with my business? You know, what do I think I need to protect? 
you know, whether it's some particular brand, whether you have a cool brand, that's your thing. Whether you have a new uh, industrial design for the product, that's that's a point of differentiation for you. Um, it's some new core technology. It's some hidden algorithm that processes data behind the scenes, but it really is providing an efficient way to move this, you know, data from or processing images or, or in, an improved search algorithm, that kind of thing. Um, is it some software? Is it some application that's presented to a customer or a client? Um, that you want to protect. So maybe there's design features you can look at. Maybe there's patent features you can look at. And how, what's your plan? Like, how are you going to look at the types of IP that we've talked about or, or other techniques for protecting those things? So again, this is sort of the 10,000 feet level, but when I start talking to clients, it's very, one of the very first things I look for is, you know, people come to me and say, well, I want to file a patent. And I say, okay, well, why? What's your goal? Maybe it does belong. Maybe this is to Rob's point. Maybe it does belong as a trade secret. And maybe you can get better benefit by keeping it as a secret. Um, maybe it's not something that you want to file a patent for right now, or maybe it's not ready, but what's your plan? And, and how, do we, how do we make that sort of um, happen? And what do, we, what do we do to make that happen? Um, and often there's a theme. So my theme is, you know, my exit strategy is I want to be the next Google and I want to develop my own market go for 20 or 30 years and aggressively pursue any copycats that come along. So I'm going to, you know, start from the ground up and bootstrap my way through different rounds of funding and get to a point where I can dominate a com completely dominate a market. Okay. That's a viable theme. It's a, it's a, it's a tough row to hold, but it's a way to go forward. And it's a way to sort of think about the theme for your IP strategy, because if you're, this is your theme then you know that you're going to have to be thinking about not just getting IP, but also aggressively enforcing it and being ready to deal with the costs and, and challenges associated with enforcement. Um, or maybe you're looking more to fit into a more broader distribution network. Maybe you've got a key improvement in some existing process or existing workflow, and what you're doing is you want to plug in to someone else's process and license them some technology or provide an improvement on something that they're already doing. So maybe you're licensing upstream or downstream that sort of process. Something like that is going to have a little bit of a different flavor because now you're going to be thinking about IP more surgically. You're going to be thinking about, you know, I don't really want to get involved involved in enforcement and perhaps the associated costs with that, but I know I want to use this to develop strategic partnerships. I know I want to find the right partners to work with, and I'm going to help maybe grow their business as I grow a piece of it on my own. So perhaps maybe a more modest theme, but perhaps one that might be more attainable. These are just two examples, right? And I think it's important to understand you know, there, there may not be a clear theme in the beginning, but as you think about your business and as your business continues to evolve, your business goals and your IP goals, you should continue to review them against each other to make sure that they're still lined up. Uh, a number of years ago, maybe eight or nine years ago now, I had a, a very good client who we were getting patents left, right, and center. And the technology was very cool. It related to providing uh, nitrogen and carbon uh, dioxide into beer. Um, Thought it was a really cool technology. The prototyping worked really, really well. The patents were pretty cool. We were getting a lot of success with the patent office. And at some point, the clients came to me and said, "We're going to shut it down. We just can't make this work. This line of the business is not has not been able to be commercially successful." And so, because of that, we basically you know pulled the plug on that existing portfolio. But what that client did well was they were they were looking at where their business was going and their long term. Like their long-term goal in that case was to license the technology. And they shopped around to a bunch of potential licensors and eventually came to a conclusion, none of them wanted to buy the tech. None of them saw it plugging into their ecosystem in a way that was going to be productive for them. So they came to me and said, this isn't working. Let's, let's pivot on to the other idea that we have, which was a different, a different type of technology. And that's where they spent their focus. So... Coming back to your theme and revising your theme as you learn more information, I think is important. Um, understanding your geographic markets. I mean, again, this sounds kind of very, very simple and very obvious or intuitive, but where is your market and what are you going to do to protect it? You know, we were obviously often thinking about a domestic market in Canada. We're obviously thinking about Canada. And I, when I say domestic, I often think of the U.S. because it's, you know, it's right next door to us and it's such an important market. But what about Europe or India or China? Um, even Canada as a market, you know, if the main markets are perhaps in, in the U.S., there may not be a strong market in Canada. And it might, might be okay in certain cases to pick and choose the countries that you want to file into. 
you can find yourself in a situation where you overextend yourself very, very quickly. In a perfect world with unlimited budgets, you know, every idea you have would be filed in every country of the world. But practically, that would be just so cost prohibitive for most clients. And, and I would say every client should be looking at their strategic filings where they're going to pursue protection. So not just what you're protecting and how well it aligns with your business from a technology perspective, but what is, where, where does it align with your business goals as far as where the company is going? And realistically, if you know you're going to be U.S. centric for the next five or six years, it's OK to focus on getting IP in that space. Uh, I've seen clients over the years where they focus on trying to go too broad too quickly and they end up getting into a very high burn rate on their IP portfolio and ultimately have to drop cases in exotic countries, places like Australia or New Zealand or Japan because they don't have any market there and they haven't had market there for five years. And so we're spending money defending a country where you don't have any commercial activity. So thinking about geographic markets and where you want to protect yourself, uh, it's very important. Um, from an investor perspective too, one of the, oh, sorry, was that Ashley had a question? Yeah, sorry to interrupt. So it's, it's clear that like, if there's, let's say a provisional patent filed in the U S it has no applicability in Canada, right? So if, if the decision is made that you're, going to pursue the Canadian market, the advice from what I just heard you say is file something there. And that's okay. It's not an onerous cost, but you know, you still have to essentially do it in both markets. Is that what I'm to understand? Yeah, another good question. That it's 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 almost exactly correct. There's there's a wrinkle to it that I'll add because it does help as we dig deeper into it, you see some things that are actually quite useful. The basic rule is that each type of IP protection, whether it's a trademark, a copyright, or a patent, ultimately is protected in, in one country. So it's, it's each registration gets you protection in one country. So if you file for a U.S. patent, you get a U.S. patent, you have protection in the United States. Similarly, if you file for a patent in Canada, you get your patent in Canada, you have protection within the territories of Canada. Okay. In practice, it's a little better than that. So it's not quite that bad or not quite that limiting because what we're looking for is some sort of nexus between commercial activity and the country. So if a product is manufactured in Canada but sold into the United States and I only have a U.S. patent, I can still capture those Canadian activities when they enter into the United States. Okay. Um, as an example that I've seen directly, we have a client in the automotive space and in their sector, there is activity happening in Mexico where the products are manufactured in Mexico and ultimately sold into the United States. We were able to get license revenues for the activities happening in Mexico because the product ultimately ended up in the United States, even though we didn't have at the time any Mexican IP. So we're looking for a nexus between commercial activity, whether it's manufacturing, distribution, sales, some sort of use, in a particular country. And if we can sort of find a way to um, put IP in countries where one of those things is happening, then you can have success on the enforcement side. Obviously in a perfect world, you have, you'd have protection in all of the countries of interest, but that can become expensive. Does that answer your question, Ash? Yeah, it does. I may actually follow up offline. <laughs> yeah, please do. Um, there's things that we can do. And one of the things at the bottom of that list you'll see is a PCT application. So one thing we can do, to for some of the decision-making process, so you have more time to decide where you want to go, is to file a PCT case. And that really is kind of an international placeholder and gives you time. And you're basically buying time before you have to pick and choose your, your winners and losers. Mm -hmm. um, I'll, I'll say, you know, as, as a startup and scale up, it often feels a little demoralizing, like I'm only going to be able to get one part of the market or one country or one region because that's all we can sort of practically pursue. Even at the larger company level, I talk to a lot of larger companies where, you know, they still pick their winners and losers. They still pick, okay, we're just going to file this in the U.S. because that's going to cover 85% of our market share. And we know that our competitors really want to be in the U.S. If we can protect ourselves there, it's going to be really hard for them to, to, to compete with us if they're only selling in Canada or they're only selling in some of, some other marginal countries. So, um, yeah, trying to try to. Uh, Keep that in mind. It's a it's a positive thing. So everyone, even at the larger levels, they're still answering and asking the same questions. Right. Um, 
There was a question here for, uh, from Catherine for trademarks. People could wait a few years to file in additional countries. What do you suggest for a small business client for patenting if they plan to expand to other countries in two to five years, but don't have the budget right now? So yeah, that's right. So that's a good point. So on the trademark space, what's interesting about trademarks is it's tied to commercial activity. So if you have commercial activity in the US, but you don't have any activity in, in let's say Australia, for example, you can delay that filing and you're not going to preclude yourself from filing later on, so long as no one else has come along and has started to sell you know, products using the similar type of brand. With patents, um, you're, you're limited by the fact that once the technology goes public, you are really con constrained by your ability to further file. So one of the reasons I mentioned the PTT is it does buy you some additional time. And Catherine's question was about how much longer. So your, your PCT time adds an extra 18 months to your window. And the way that works in practice is, let's say you filed your first application today. We'll often file first in the US because it's a main market for virtually all of our clients. If you do nothing, you have at least, a, you have a year, one year, 12 months to decide what other countries you want to file in. So, you know, absent any other filings, you can file in the U.S., wait 11 months, and then file in Canada, Australia, New Zealand, Japan, India, and so on and so forth. At that one-year anniversary, if you want to get more time, you can file a PCT. And a PCT is going to give you an extra 18 months, really gives you a total of 30 months from your original filing date. So two and a half years. So Catherine's question about how long do you have on the patent side you can get up to two and a half years through the PCT process um, through that. And that's, you know, the, it's not inexpensive. You're looking at an extra six or $7,000 for the PCT case, but that's the price you pay to sort of give yourself an extra year and a half of time. Catherine, did I answer your question okay? Or do you want to have some follow-up on that? No, that that's great. So it's actually longer than the 18 months. You have the one year and then you get an additional 18 months. So that's as long as you can stretch it out, so to speak. <laughs> that's, that's as long as you can stretch it out. Now, when we, when we, you know, we can gain this a little bit, right? If we know, like when, when you, depends on when you first filed your case, your first application. So the timing of that, if you have, let's say you don't have any public disclosure and you're not too concerned about other technologies out there, you can maybe push that deadline out a little bit and file your provisional or your first case a little bit later. But yes, once you've got that first application on file, your sort of your latest window is about 30 months out, so two and a half years out. Make sense? Yeah, no, that's great. Thank you. That's helpful because it's a question I get asked quite a lot. <laughs> yeah, it's a good question. Um, it's, uh, listen, we wish there was ways of getting more time, but at some point, you, you know, you've got to decide. The PCT process is good. It's been around since the 70s gave us an extra year and a half that we never used to have. So in that sense, it's a big plus, but it, it would always be nice to have more time. Right. Okay. Thanks. Perfect. Thank you. Um, so we're talking about timing. So, um, right. So one of the key things here is, you know, does your timing align with your, your current position, your current goals, and also your future goals, you know, where do you plan on going? So are you spending IP on the right kinds of patents at the right time? You know, early on in the process, you know, you should not be blowing 80% of your, your budget on IP filings. As much as I would love you to say, let's spend 80% of my budget on patent filings, you know, that's good, good news for me, not good news for the long-term viability of the company. And an investor wants to see balance. So they want to see that you've got some relative um, proportion between your spend on IP and the other things that are critical to the business. So making sure that you're timing your filings and the scope of your filings lines up with what you're doing. Um, and there was a question that was asked before the presentation that I wanted to specifically address is sort of when should you be filing? You know, is it at the idea stage, at the prototype stage, um, some connection to your first sales? I'll, I'll say that those are all good times to be thinking about it if you haven't already done so. It's never too early to talk to a patent professional about your idea, because the earlier you talk to someone, you can get, you know, first of all, strategic guidance about where things may go and, and what you should be thinking about. But, you know, even at the early idea stage, you can start thinking about, well, maybe we want to put an, a patent around this. Um, this goes back to, I think, Ash's question from the beginning. 
you know, if you really have discovered a new concept and a new technical solution, maybe you want to try to get that really broad patent early on, because that might actually have some commercial value. Um, it might, be, might not be the commercial product, but from a patent perspective, it might be a very, very valuable patent to have in your quiver. Um, certainly, as you get to prototyping, the product becomes more defined. It becomes clear what the patent is going to look like, and we often engage with clients that are doing that. Um, and certainly, excuse me, around this time of your first sale, preferably before your first sale or before your first public disclosure. I've got another slide in a minute about some of the pitfalls. You want to make sure you try to get your patents on file in at least your first country before there's public disclosure for reasons we'll talk about in a minute. So the timing is important and it does, it never hurts to sort of ask early on in the process. Um, okay, keep moving. Um, it's also important from, a, from an investor perspective that you have an understanding of your competitor's IP and not just, you know, what they have, but what's their perspective when it comes to IP? If you know you're going into a very litigious environment where the, um, the, the it's full of bloodthirsty sharks that are constantly suing each other, you need to be prepared for that. And you need to have a strategy to deal with it. Conversely, you might go into an industry where people have IP, but they're much more respectful and much more deferential to others. And even just the fact that you're filing can be a powerful deterrent to keep others from sort of coming into your territory. Uh, you know, when when companies like Factory got involved in the telecom space, it was readily apparent at the time that folks like Nortel and Nokia and Qualcomm were very, very aggressive at getting patents, but also at pursuing their rivals. And it was a very, very competitive environment right out of the gate. So if you're a company like BlackBerry, even just getting started, you need to pay attention to the fact and know that you're, you know, once you start having commercial success, you can expect there to be a fight. You can expect your competitors to come after you. So having some competitive intelligence and doing some due diligence around what's in the marketplace can be really, really helpful. Um, it's also important to understand if there's some core piece of IP that's going to be in your way. Right. If, if in order for your light bulb to work, you need to buy or license the light bulb patents, you need to know that and you, and you should know that as early as possible. So understanding the IP landscape from a perspective of, you know, what are their, what are the roadblocks to you bringing your product to market is really, really important. And as we talked about, you know, if they're aggressive and enforcing, you need to be ready for that. Perhaps by filing your own patents, you can be prepared for um, a, a, a cross licensing deal, or you can at least have some defensive portfolio that you can use if you do get attacked, or, or inevitably when you do when you do get attacked. Okay, I'm going to talk now about some pitfalls, and this is kind of uh, uh, under the theme of things that you, you know, that we've seen that you need to avoid and that you sort of want to think about. Uh, I'm probably dating myself by putting this up there, but um, I mean, I grew up in sort of the early '80s, and so Atari, ColecoVision, those are, that was my jam back then. Um, my kids now are onto like Switch and PlayStation, so I'm I'm feeling very old and very um, out of touch with uh, technology these days. Um, so let's talk about some some common pitfalls. One, and this is a little bit like the dentist reminding you to clean your teeth. You you can't ignore IP, right? You don't have to talk to me. You can talk to someone else, but you can't ignore it. I mean, it's it's too valuable today for companies. Too many investors are going to ask you questions about this. You you need to clean your teeth and you need to do your due diligence and at least be aware that IP is out there and have a strategy. Maybe the strategy is we're going to keep everything a secret, and that's a perfectly legitimate strategy to consider. You need to at least have gone through the thought process of making sure you understand, you know, what your IP strategy will be and, and you know, why you're doing what you're doing. Um, on the other side, is as we talked about a few a few seconds ago, you can't file too many applications. You can't be too invested in the IP and, and ignore the rest of the core pieces of the business. Um, it's nice when my clients have a really strong interest in IP. I think it's good for clients. I've seen a lot of successful clients that are very involved and very active in the IP space. But if they're filing too many patent applications for things that are not that relevant or filing in too many jurisdictions where they're not having revenue or not seeing commercial activity, you know, they're making a mistake because they need to make sure that they control the spend rate as much as they protect themselves. So it's a little bit like finding that sort of Goldilocks moment where you're kind of in between, you know, you know, too little, too much, but just right. And so you want to find that. What does that mean in practice? Well, as I said a few minutes ago, you should be revisiting your theme and your evolution on a regular basis. You should be thinking about where are we filing? 
and why are we filing? And you shouldn't be afraid to kill things off, right? If you know that, say, you, you filed early on in your, in your company a patent on some core piece of technology, and three years later, you realize you are no longer using that because it's not what your clients want, or it's not really that, it's not going to work the way you intended, it's perfectly legitimate to drop that if you can't see a, a way to return some investment on that. Maybe there's other folks you could license it to, but at the very least, you should be thinking about you know, letting things go when they're not going to use commercial value and they're not aligned with the business goals. Um, there's a question from Brandy, but how much information can I share if I've not filed a patent for my technology? That's a good question, Brandy. I've got a comment here on a couple of slides on public disclosure. Maybe I'll jump over to that one. We'll talk about that. Let me jump to this one here. So <clears throat> when you haven't filed your patent, the, the challenge with any sort of disclosure in a public way is that it can be fatal to your ability to file in certain parts of the world. Um, and I use Europe as the big example because Europe has some of the most restrictive rules around this. If you were to go and start a website today and show your product and you haven't already filed for your patent, that can create massive headaches for you in, in Europe uh, and other parts of the world. The scope of what you're sharing and how you're sharing it really matters. So if you're sharing something with a potential investor and there's an understanding or an obligation of confidence, even if there's not a, an official written NDA, Normally, those those one-on-one -on -one conversations may be treated as confidential. If you're pitching to a, an angel investor group like GTAN, and you're getting it in front of a room of 200 plus people, that is not going to be a private conversation. That is going to be effectively a public event. So anything you're talking about can impact your ability to provide or to pursue patent rights down the road. We always recommend you file an application before those kind of public events. And the more public the event, the more why is what you're talking about it, the more critical it becomes that you file early on in the process. Um, even leaving aside places like Europe, you know, in Canada and the United States, if you have a public disclosure event, let's say you do a pitch at an at a angel investor group event, um, it does start a one-year clock, so you do need to get something on file within one year from that disclosure date. So the things that you're showing your investors, the things that you're showing to the public, can really limit your ability later on to file for patent protection, if, if you're not careful. Um, let me come back to this one. Uh, another pitfall we commonly see is the scope of claims. You'll see patent claims that are either way too broad, in which cases you know they end up getting beaten up at the patent office and they may never get approved, um, or they may end up being invalidated. Even if you get to the patent office, if it's way, way too broad, you, you might be setting your patent up for a very difficult life down the road. Um, on the other hand, if it's too narrow and it's easily something that you can design around. If your claim is too focused on one particular, let's say it's the commercial embodiment you're selling, your competitors can come right up to the line and try to sell things that are very, very similar without um, without infringing on your patent rights. And thus your patent rights are effectively you know, watered down because you're not getting the full scope of protection you should be getting. So pay attention to the scope of the claims you're getting in patents because that can be really important. How are we doing for questions? Is there any questions from the audience? I'll just jump out there now maybe. I've been talking for a bit of time, so I'm happy to uh, to poll the audience if there's any questions you want to speak about. If not, I'll keep going. Assuming everyone's still awake, that's good. That's good news. I brought some coffee, so I'm here for the full full two hours. Um, okay. Um, provisional patents. I want to talk about those specifically. I love provisional patents. We file them all the time. It's one of the best ways of getting uh, an early stage company. Um, getting protection for some of their key features. You don't have all of the same requirements, the fancy drawings and some of the same rules around how pretty things have to be and how formalized things have to be. So it's a great way to get what I would say a rough draft of a patent application on file. I put this caveat in though, because I've seen provisionals um, that can be problematic. Be mindful of the fact that, you know, I can't file a one page PowerPoint presentation with a drawing and have that suffice as a provisional application. The provisional applications that we file still have to meet the same legal requirements of a full application. So we need to have in there a full description of the invention, a full set of drawings, and we need to at least have turned our mind to the scope of the claims that you're gonna be getting, i.e. the scope of the protection you're gonna be able to get in order for us to be able to defend that provisional later on. 
So going back to Catherine's question, you know, if you're talking about filing in a two and a half year filing strategy where you may want to go into Europe and Australia, maybe Canada, maybe India, you want to make sure that your original provisional filing is good enough that it's going to hold up to the scrutiny in all those countries. And I've personally been involved in a case where we had um, a, a very good application filed in, in Europe, but because the priority date was based on a series of actually five Russian provisional applications that one of our counterparts had drafted and filed in Russia, ultimately the European case was invalidated because the Russian cases were missing some key features. And when we went to pursue the European case, there was a piece of technology that had showed up in between those two dates and it created a lot of problems for the client and ultimately led to um, invalidating the patent. Uh, I think Bob's dropping off. Oh, thanks, thanks, Bob. I'm happy to answer any questions you might have offline if you want to follow up. So please do reach out. We talked about public disclosure. Um, I, had, I had a question before. Oh, here's a question from Brandy. How often should I be doing patent research to see if I'm infringing or other ideas and making sure my technology is relevant? That's a good question. And I'll jump to um, this one. So something we want to talk about, uh, this gets bandied around a, a lot, and people are often worried that the product they're going to be selling is going to come to market and I'm going to be infringing someone else's patent. I will cut to the chase. The chances are that you're probably infringing someone else's patent. If you want to make sure that you're not infringing, we would do what's called a freedom to operate or a clearance search. And what we're doing is looking for some guarantee that the product you're selling doesn't intersect or interact with anyone else's patents that are out there. The problem is this is an incredibly expensive and incredibly time consuming exercise because basically, you know, there are over 10 million issued U.S. patents. Um, a lot of those are expired, but there's at least a couple of million that are still in force today. And what you're trying to do is clear to make sure that you don't infringe a single piece of any of those those patent claims. And that can be really problematic. Um, it's at the very least very, very expensive and very, very time consuming. And we do get involved in the type of project. But we often get involved in this kind of project for large multinational companies where, particularly if there's two competitors that, you know, like Apple and Samsung, that we know are constantly butting heads over issues and they want to clear some issue where they've got some new product out and they want to try to minimize their risk, then they will do a freedom to operate opinion and look to do some clearance. As a startup, as a scale up, it's very, very difficult to spend that much money on something when it's really, really speculative. And when I talk to my clients, I, I think it's much more critical that you actually try to deliver a product or service that your clients want. That's the same thing investors want. Investors want to see that you have sales and, and revenue, right? They, they want to get to the point where, you know, you've got product that, that your clients want to buy, that your customers want to buy. Um, if you end up bumping into someone else's patents, I'm not trying to minimize that risk, but it's, a, it's an issue that you're almost thankful to have because if you're having that issue, it means you're having some level of commercial success. Um, if you're not having commercial success, the process of you bumping into someone's patent and it being an issue are a lot smaller because there frankly isn't enough money on the table for them to actively come after you. And if there is, you know, your damages are going to be so limited to some percentage of your sales that your risk is going to be very, very, very small. Um, you're probably at that point what we call judgment proof because the scope of your sales, you know, if, you, if you've only sold $10 with a product, no one's going to spend a half a million dollars on a patent case to pursue that. There's just no, no return they're going to get on that. So, you know, as your, your company becomes more successful, as your products become more widespread, it's almost inevitable that you're going to have those types of issues. So I'm not saying to, that to sort of make light of those issues, but I'm saying it because they are um, practically something that it's very, very difficult to avoid doing early on. <laughs> oh, and by the way, at a really early stage, you know, it's very common for your technology to evolve. So you might want to do a freedom to operate opinion today. And in a year and a half, you realize, you know what, my, my, my whole technology has to evolve this way now because I have to do things in three or four different ways, which means that the freedom to operate opinion is now not as valuable as it was because you're missing key features or key components. Okay, that's a good question though. Um, other things to avoid? This is one that we, we see all the time. You know, you want to make sure that you manage your relationship with your service providers, particularly lawyers. And I'll say that sometimes lawyers are some of the worst offenders because we can be very, very expensive. You want to manage things like your accounting spend, your legal spend in a way that is not going to uh, 
unduly create problems for you, but it's also not going to burn through all your cash. And you shouldn't be talking to your lawyer every single day. It's great when I talk to my clients, but manage your spend. You know, driving a Honda will still get you to where you want to go most of the time. Okay. And I have two case studies there that I've, I've worked on with clients where, you know, I have some clients, one client in particular, where they had a very good in-house counsel who did a good job managing his legal spend and keeping it very controlled for a period of time. And they went through a number of funding rounds. And at every single stage, the investors, you know, even though he did things in a way where, you know, he maybe didn't do, for example, things like a freedom to operate opinion, he wouldn't spend money on that because he said, it's not worth my investment. It's not worth the cost. The investors appreciated the, the smart money decisions that were being made. So the fact that he, uh, at the time, was doing things, doing things right, but not doing, you know, it's not a question of leaving no stone unturned. It was doing the essentials and doing those well. So they closed on additional funding and it's gone very well for them because the investors saw that there was a, a reasonable balance to the judgment. And it was, a, it was very well received. Um, on the other end of the spectrum, I, I've seen clients where, you know, they try to do things at, at the absolute bare bones on the legal span, for example. And if the corporation isn't properly set up right, you know, you can have two partners that are involved. Uh, and early on, everything seems to be going fine. And then later on, you realize, you know, one of the partners wants to leave or one partner wants to push the other one out. If they don't have a proper setup, set of bylaws and corporate structure and all of that thing, it can be very, very difficult to control um, and manage that exit. And in some cases, it, it, it can be very, very difficult. In this case in particular, I was involved with the or the party that was leaving basically was able to attach a bunch of riders to the control of the IP. And so it limited their ability to do some further funding because when the company was created, it wasn't, you know, they, they should have done a little bit more on the corporate side to clean things up and to sort of solidify the framework of the relationship. And that turned out to cost them a lot in the end of the, at the, end of the day. So. Um, manage your legal spend, don't cut corners, but don't overspend on your, your legal as well. Um, there's a question about programs to cover the cost of a patent. There are um, shred credits that can be available. This is not an area where, frankly, we have a lot of expertise in covering the costs. Um, there are expertise, uh, there, are, there are specialists and consultants that can be involved in doing shred credits, for example. Um, at the moment, you know, it's it's uh, it's, there's no question getting a patent is a very, very expensive process, but we look at it for our clients as, you know, an investment and something that you're going to build on for the future, not so much something that, you know, you can't really look at it just as, as an expense. And the reason I think we, we start with that is to go back to what I said early on in the process, the, the patent filing, the IP filing has to align with the business goals. And if it aligns with the business goals, then you can make the connection and you can justify the investment. And there's no question it is going to be an investment. Okay. Um, I do want to talk about a couple of control issues around IP, and then maybe we'll open it up for more questions. Um, I see we're moving through the time pretty quickly here, so I hope everyone's still enjoying it. Um, one of the key, key things that we've often seen when we talk to investors and in startups or scale that's going through the investment process is what's the control situation around the IP? And a lot of this sounds very intuitive and very, very simple, but you'd be surprised how often, or perhaps not surprised how often this comes up as a potential issue. And the key one is really ownership, is you know if you have an IP um, part of the company, if it's a patent filing, if it's a trademark filing, if it's a design, some, some photographs, some design work, can you provide ownership? Can you provide clear ownership from the inventors or the originators of that work? And when, you, when we talk about this, it's important to keep in mind that there's a long list of people who may be involved. And you start with your traditional employees. And the hope is that you have you know, very good employment agreements with those folks. Um, but as you go down this list, you start to see that there may be relationships that may or may not fall under a classic employment agreement. Um, you almost always have a situation where you're gonna have some contractors um, or some freelancers. What's the relationship with those folks? Do you have very clear ownership of even simple things like, you know, your design for your website. You know, when you sign your contract to get your website designed, are you making sure that you own the content so that you can later use that content or modify that content? Similarly, are you making sure that they own, they have the rights to use that content? If they're bringing in photographs or images, you know, are they doing that from their own archives? Are they doing that from a, a licensed site like Shutterstock? Or are they using something inappropriately? 
making sure you look at those agreements early on and, and sort those out so you have control and have ownership. Um, we've seen a lot of issues over the years with co-op students and students in general, partially because, and I listen, I was a co-op student. I think they're fantastic. It's a great resource and it's a great way as a student to get valuable experience, but they tend to be temporary, right? The, the terms are often very, very short, only a few months, and those folks tend to move around a little bit. So we, one, you want to make sure that you you sort of identify and maintain control of the of the IP early on. So clear employment agreements and so on, and anything that you need to get signed, like paperwork or assignments to sort of solidify that, should be done as early as possible. Um, in a related way, you know, managing people like that and their access to trade secrets. You know, they may be wonderful students, but they may, you know, there's been instances where a student left the company and took a laptop with them. And on that laptop, there was some source code. So, you know, their access to code, their access to proprietary information, just make sure you manage that and make sure you mitigate those issues and make sure you, you know, make sure you have ownership of all those issues. So the big one is employment agreements. And by the way, we often see this with founders. You know, two founders get involved or three founders get involved in the company and they don't think to put in employment agreements and employment assignments um, for things like IP. Um, it's good to have all that stuff in there so that later on, you know, if person A wants to leave the company or let's say person B, you know, wants to sort of execute a shotgun clause and, you know, and collapse everything onto one person, then the, there's no questions about ownership and there's no concerns about ownership. This one comes up all the time. You know, if, if you're working with someone, can you make sure that they were not working with someone else? And especially with freelancers or co-op students, what were their existing relationships to other employers? And to the extent that they came up with some ideas while they were with those other people, those other companies, you know, there may be some residual rights that attach to the previous employer. So making sure that you have a clean understanding of where people are in their employment relationships if people are moonlighting for you while they're working for BlackBerry or working for someone else, that can be a big problem. A lot of those bigger companies have very restrictive IP agreements and, you know, their, their ideas that they're coming over to you with, you know, there's question marks at the very least that get raised. As an investor who's coming into a company, you want to have a clean IP ownership clause. You want to have very clean chain of title, whether it's from employees or freelancers or, or even from third parties, you know, university partnerships, other, other, um, folks you've purchased patents from or that you're licensing patents from, you want to make sure that that is as clean as possible. Um, and it should be documented. Uh, I mean, I can't stress this enough. It's very easy to say, oh, I've got a right to use that or I've got a license to use that. Well, make sure you can point to the license and make sure you have a copy of that and file that with your, your lawyer or uh, someone that you trust to keep, keep track and tab of things. Um, on the other side of that is things like joint ownership. You know, you may get into a situation where you and a third party are jointly developing some technology. Maybe you're doing it with the university. Maybe you're doing it with another third party. Are you going to maintain ownership individually as joint owners? So each person owns a piece of the technology or is it going to be collapsed into a single company or a single entity? Joint ownership can create some problems because you know, if two people co-own something, you know, how do you manage access to that? How do you manage control of that? It's a little different if, if, if two people co-own a stapler you know, there's a physical thing that can be shared between two people and one person has possession and then can hand it off to the other person. IP, as we talked about in the very first couple of slides, is intangible. So you can't stop someone else from practicing the invention if they're a co-owner. So being able to control their rights, being able to control their abilities to do something, which, by the way, includes their rights to sell or license to others, can be a big problem. So be careful about joint ownership. Be aware of the pitfalls, and it's probably worth getting advice on things like that. Any questions on the control of ownership of IP? Brandy, are we still doing okay for time? Yeah, we're sitting at about 2.15. Great, perfect. So I'll keep talking for another maybe 20 minutes or so, and um, if there's more questions at the end, we can, we can jump back to those. But please do jump in if you have questions as we go through. Uh, on the same time, we talked about control of the IP, but do you have control of the product? Do you have the right to sell the product? So are you actually selling something you own? And, and we see all kinds of pitfalls around this with respect to things like license code. You know, maybe you're, you're, you're licensing a piece of technology from someone else, you know, either to an open source license or some other license. Do you actually have the rights to do that, the things you think you do? So do you have the right to incorporate that into your, into your code? Do you have the right to incorporate that without being forced to disclose your code. Some of these open source licenses 
are very problematic and they require you to disclose downstream rights or even limit your ability to commercialize or enforce some of your rights. Um, we see this all the time with things like, you know, images and media icons, logos, things that you've incorporated into the design aspects of an application, making sure that all of the people that are involved have signed over their rights to you and that you do have control of the product that you're actually shipping out the door. I, and I sort of hinted at this, but open source licensing, you know, there's a number of different agreement types that are out there. And, and first of all, understanding where the code comes from and what particular license it's covered under can be problematic and, and confusing. Oftentimes it's best to try to replace that code with code that you've written on your own um, because you want to avoid licenses that may restrict your commercial activities or may even sort of poison the well and require you to disclose things like your code or just disclose improvements or make those available for, free, for future use by other people. So you want to be very, very careful about that. Okay. Um, I got a handful of slides, maybe three or four more slides, and then maybe we'll, we'll stop for questions. Um, and then I've got maybe some case studies at the end we can talk about some examples yeah, in a bit more specific detail. Um, so what is IP really worth? I mean, you know, when we talk about IP, we talked about scarcity, we talked about valuation. There was a question before the slide about, you know, what should I put into my pitch to investors and how should I explain my IP position? I think it's very clear, you know, having done this for a while and having talked to a number of investors and a number of startups that are getting investors, you know, valuation is important. But I will say, you know, I read an article this week talking about valuation in the Harvard Business Review, and it's not the number one thing, right? The, the, the number one sort of factor seems to be when doing a deal is your cash on cash return. So understanding where IP fits in the valuation scheme is important, and it's a key piece for a lot of companies, but it's certainly not the be all and end all. I think that there are as much, if not more important factors around you know, what's the potential return on investment and also what's the team look like, what's the leadership team look like, and how do they take the company and, and grow it. And a lot of VCs are looking for, for a big exit, so a way to return that cash. So, you know, from what I've what I've gleaned from this is that it's important to explain your IP story, your IP strategy in a way that's going to line up with your exit. And again, if you have a good theme that, you know, my theme is I want to, you know, get involved in this, this product distribution cycle and I want to plug into this piece and I want to license upstream or downstream to these folks. And that's my revenue chain. Um, understanding how the IP is going to help plug into that and, and, and how it's going to differentiate yourself, uh, I think is a key story when you're talking to investors to explain you know, how, how is this value, how is this IP going to increase the valuation and encourage me to invest in the company? You know, is there a way to put a fence around an idea or a brand that's going to be attractive, not just to, you know, long-term clients, but also to other investors, right? Especially early stage investors are often looking to exit out before, you know, before you hit the next stage of, you know, you're before the multi-million dollar empire becomes global, right? They're looking to get out at an earlier stage so is there a way of making um, the IP investment more short-term focused? Is there a way of sort of getting it sort of to the point where other investors are going to see the value and be more attractive or be more attractive to the deal to, to, to get to a Series A or a Series B round? Um, the other thing I'll mention generally, and we've seen this with a lot of our interactions with investors, and this is not to pick on them, but a lot of them don't have a very good understanding of IP. And one of the reasons I put together the intro slides with the sort of the types of IP was to just serve as a reminder. And those are tools you can use when you talk to your investors to explain, because sometimes they don't really understand. And I've seen questions from sophisticated investors who still mix up copyright and patents or still mix up trademarks and patents. So, you know, I think it's important to explain what you're doing. And on the IP side, assume that they don't necessarily understand, right? And so assume that they may not have a full understanding of IP and how it plugs into things and explain it to them. Explain why we are filing a patent in a certain area, what we are trying to cover with the claims. These claims are directed to this, and this is where we think the value is, and this is where we think their prior art is, and this is why we think we're different. So the more you can explain the story in, in a way um, that even, a, even, a, and a, even sophisticated investors will appreciate, I think, having the whole story told to them. I've been involved personally in a number of calls with investors on behalf of my clients where I do exactly this, you know, and I, as a lawyer, I have ethical obligations. So I, I'm honest and I'm objective, but I will explain, you know, here is, here's what the prior discloses, here's where it, where it doesn't disclose something. And here's where we think we're going to be able to get a patent. There's obviously no guarantees, but sometimes having a professional advisor on the phone can be a good way to 
walk investors through the process and help them understand the IP piece more generally. So, um, and the, another point that I'll mention, because I think this is really important on the IP side, is you know I've seen a lot of clients where there's a risk of falling into the great idea trap. And when I talk about the great idea trap, I, I think it comes from the idea that if I have a great idea, that's enough and it's gonna take care of itself and I don't need to do anything further to build it into a business. And I've seen a lot of cases where a client with a middle idea, not the best idea, but an okay piece of technology created a really fantastic business around it because they were able to take advantage of the fact that this is something people really want and it's just that much different enough to, to make the product really successful. Um, on the other hand, I've seen clients with fantastic ideas who have struggled at times to build a good business around them because they don't know quite how to connect with the technology or they don't know quite how to, to disrupt the existing marketplace. Um, uh, Clayton Christensen, who has written books like The uh, Innovator's Dilemma and The Innovator's Solution, has spent a lot of time doing research on you know, how do you go into a marketplace and disrupt it? And how do you take an existing incumbent on and actually compete with them? So understanding that the, the idea itself is not enough, you still need time determination and perhaps a bit of luck. And, and there's a couple of examples I use here. Inventions that are now as ubiquitous as the Workmate or the Sippy Cup or even Edison's light bulb, you know, took a lot of sweat and tears to get to a stage where they were actually commercially successful. And it wasn't enough just to have a working prototype it took a long, long time of sort of beating the beating people's doors down to get to the idea, to get the idea in front of enough people until it finally took off. So be mindful of the fact that when you're talking to investors, you can't just sit on your haunches and say, well, I've got a great idea. That should be enough. No, you still, of course, need to build the rest of the business around you know, what makes my company special, what's going to make this product really successful. All right. Um, that's the end of my official sort of slide presentation. I've got some case studies I can talk about. I'm also happy to answer any um, any questions or sort of sort of take the conversation uh, in any direction that you'd like at this point. So, Brandy, was there any other questions from the audience that you wanted to talk about? Um, there was one specific to finding an industry-specific patent lawyer, um, and how do you test their competencies in the industry? Uh, that's a great question. Um, the the short answer is, I think it's really important to have a, a patent lawyer who speaks the same technical language. Now, full disclosure, that's one of the things that I think is great about our firm, but even generally, you don't have to work with a firm like ours. There's lots of other great firms out there. I think it's important that you talk to a lawyer who has experience in the technology space. So I trained as a mechanical engineer. I'm very comfortable with mechanical and electromechanical devices. I also spent a couple of years working in telecom. So I kind of know where my level of competencies are, where my comfort level is. I'm not going to handle a chemical case. Uh, I'm not going to handle a very complicated computer science case or a very you know hardware centric um, wireless communication case because it's just outside of my area of comfort. I can do it. I'm a reasonably smart guy, but at some point it becomes inefficient and I don't know the right kind of technical questions to ask. So I would say whatever patent lawyer you're meeting with, he or she, you should make sure you ask the technical questions first. Make sure that you can ask them the hard technical questions and that they understand and, and can come up with answers to those or can at least understand what you're talking about. Because you don't want to get into a situation where you have the wrong technical person looking at the technology. They might miss something, they might mischaracterize something in a way that's going to eventually come back to bite you. How do you find that person? You know, I think there's some great firms out there. You can find resources. At our firm, we kind of organize people based on their, their backgrounds. So our bios, I think most firms are like this, but our bios talk about what their background is and what our specialties are. And I think that's really important from our perspective. And most firms, I think they try to have people specialize in a particular sector. So maybe somebody is in the pharmaceutical space, somebody is in the software space. And it's just a matter of like just, you know, individual specialization. People become very, very specialized, even within the patent world, about doing certain things. I have been involved more and more recently around IP strategic guidance. So I'm doing a lot of work like we've talked about today, where meeting with clients, coming up with strategies about, okay, what should we be filing? Where should we be filing? What should we not be filing? And then I'm working with my colleagues who are doing a lot of the, what I call the execution side, where they're smarter than I am on better you know, hardware engineering. So those are the ones that are drafting those hardware cases. 
or software cases and are getting those executed where I'm thinking about other things like global finance strategies and, and timing of things and so on and so forth. So um, I think it's important to interview that person. So when you meet with them, give them an interview and make sure you ask the tough technical questions so that they can, they can, you can really get a sense of do they have the, the level of, of expertise that you need. So, was that okay, Brandy? I think that was a long answer, but I thought that was. Yeah, that's great. Um, great. Another question here just around if there is any greater clarity or guidance regarding how to assess prior art and whether your innovate, innovations features constitute enough uniqueness, merit, value to warrant the insurance of a patent? Yeah, it's a good question. Uh, let me go back to the slide because I thought I, had, I might have had one on that. There we go. So understanding prior art, is it really patentable? Um, the, you know, the, the prior art one is an interesting question. You're often looking at trying to understand what's been done before and you know how different are we from what's been done before. The, the first thing I'll say is there's a uh, built into the system when you do a patent search or when you're looking at what's been filed with the patent office, there's a built-in blackout period. So 18 months after your application is filed, it's published. What that means is if we're doing a search today, anything filed in the last 18 months is not going to be searchable. So when you think about what that means, it means you're always looking at stale data. The best data I have today is from sort of 2019. So I don't have anything from 2020, and I don't have anything from the start of this year, and I don't have anything from the end of 2019. So I'm sort of middle of 20 or end of 2019. That's where my information stops. If you're in a very active technology sector, let's say you're doing something in a social media application, 18 months is an eternity. So there's there's prior art up there that you're going to just not know about until your application is filed. And there's just no way to shortcut that. So the first thing you need to understand about the prior art searching is there are, there are practical limits on your ability to search and search effectively in a way that you're going to get meaningful results back. The second thing is, you know, assuming you do have a good search and you have, have the ability to search and it's a reasonable scope, you know, you're trying to figure out, you know, your goal is often to find what's the patent office going to find. And so we're looking to recreate the kind of obstacles you're going to face when you're speaking to the patent office. And so that means you're looking for what are the closest documents. And you can do that now. There's some really fantastic tools. The biggest one that we use um, that's non-commercial is Google Patents. You know, Google has done a fantastic job of digitizing the U.S. Patent Office, Patent Office archives, and has expanded now into other jurisdictions like Europe and beyond. So you can actually go and do using Google's keyword search algorithms, go and do some keyword searching. You can also use the proprietary databases of the uh, U.S. Patent Office and CIPO, the Canadian Office, or Europe, and do some keyword searching through those. Um, we often have access to uh, commercial databases that troll or uh, that. Um, collect a lot more data and really do a great job of providing a much more deep search using much more intuitive search algorithms. But frankly, those are co those are commercially expensive and it's not something you want to dabble in. Um, it never hurts to get a, a searcher involved. You know, you may want to consider getting a prior search done by a professional. It's not, trip, trip, it's not always required. In fact, I recommend that most of my clients do some searching on your own before we ever talk because you may find stuff that's, that gives you either some comfort level that there's not much out there or a deeper understanding, of, okay, we know that this is out there and we know that this is the stuff we have to go around. So um, there's a question from Bill. When one has several different broad sets of related functions that may or may not be part of the same platform on execution, is it better to file these novel functions as a single invention or should they be separate patents? That's a fantastic question. And there's a lot of things to think about there. If you are a very early stage company, what I would typically recommend is file them as one application. Because particularly as your technology evolves, the more you have in an application, you have increased your ability to massage that application over the course of its life to focus on the things that are technically important to you. So at an early stage, I often say, let's do a kitchen sink application. Give me everything you know. Let's put it all into one big application and let's file that. Because that's going to start the process that Catherine was talking about earlier, the two and a half year process where we can decide where we want to go. As long as you've got it all in there in the first application, we can take that and massage it into different spaces. As we talked about, though, depending on what stage of company you're at, your, your IP strategy should change. For 
more established companies, what we're often looking for is more focused applications, applications that are focused on a particular um, implementation of something, a particular application, a particular result. And so for larger companies or more established companies, I will often recommend taking those things and filing them as three or four or 10 applications, depending on you know, what, how many novel things are there. For example, I'm doing a, a, a patent filing strategy right now for a larger company. And in one technology area in the manufacturing space, we're filing five related applications. They're very similar. There, there are a lot of pieces that are similar, but they want to have them separately for all kinds of reasons. One is they don't necessarily want to take all of them into every single country. They want to focus on some key markets for some of these and other markets for other ones. They also want to have the ability to license them in different ways. So some of the revenue comes from licensing their patent portfolio. And they know that if they have more patents, they can license them in different ways. It's harder to do that if you have it as a single application. Uh, and frankly, they also like having larger quantities of patents. One of the things you'll see as the companies evolve is it becomes just as important to have a large quantity of patents as it does about the quality of the patents themselves because that way they can point to the size of their patent portfolio as a, as a again attractive to investors attractive to shareholders but also as a deterrent to potential competitors that might come in so Phil did that answer your question that's a, that's a really interesting one and we see it all the time but I think those are the two extremes you know at the early stage let's do a kitchen sink application later on let's come back um, and look at them probably on an individual basis. Um, yeah, that's great. Thanks, again, a lot of the, yeah, the thanks. Well, yeah, a lot of times it's case by case, and sometimes we'll we'll squish two things together. But um, it's good to be thinking about some of those bigger strategic things. Okay. Yep. Um, I see we're we're thinning out the herd here. Uh, do you want me to talk about a couple of case studies, or or do we want to wrap things up? What would you like to do, Brandy? Yeah, um, I think case studies are always always resonate with our audience really well. So uh, for those of you who want to sort of stick around for that, feel free to. Um, great. The one thing I'll point to first before, before um, anybody else goes, I've got some links here to some additional reading I thought would be helpful. I found some articles that talk specifically about kind of the intersection of IP and economics and how they relate to um, investors. Um, these were, I think, helpful to, to understand some of the issues we talked about today. Most of them are pretty short reads. Uh, the Harvard Business Review one just came out. It's not specific to IP, but it's got a really good comprehensive review of, of venture capital generally. And I think they had 900 or so venture capitals actually provide um, detailed survey results. So what I like about it is it's very comprehensive and it's very current, sort of current in 2021. So it does talk about sort of post-pandemic world and how that's impacted VCs. Um, I thought that was really useful. Um, okay, I'll just talk about a couple of ideas now. and. and uh, you know, most of these are pretty quick, so it shouldn't take more than a few minutes. But, you know, one of the examples we talked about, great ideas are not enough on their own. There's a great sort of case study around the invention of the sippy cup. And, you know, the, the highlights of this are really quite simple. The idea behind the sippy cup is you've got a container and the lid of the container has some sort of a membrane in it, um, typically with a slit or some other opening that sort of is self-closing so that, you know, unless you provide a vacuum or some suction on the outside, the the slit and the opening tends to stay closed what that means in practice is you can have juice in a container or whatever it is or water or milk and if you flip the container upside down it doesn't tend to leak so the you know the story here that i think is interesting we talk about good ideas still taking a lot of time and, and perseverance you know this comes from you know something as early as the 1990s you know knocking on doors 18 companies ultimately rejecting the idea and finally, in sort of the mid 90s, you had um, one of the folks who was getting involved in supporting this actually sent the sippy cup full of juice in the mail to a, a grocery store, to a supply chain uh, for Tesco. And effectively, that was sort of the, 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 the deal breaker that broke this open because in that box, you know, the, they put the container in with fruit juice loose to sort of ravel around. And along with that was a letter saying, you know, if you if, don't buy my product, if this if this letter is wet or if the product leaks. And it was a really good sort of proof of concept to show that how well the system actually works and how well the device actually works um, in, in practice. So, you know, my takeaway from that, it's a very simple example, but even a product as good as that, even something that today we take for granted, I've got three kids, they've all lived and breathed that typical age for a while. 
you know, it took six years of sort of beating the doors down to really go from good idea, patentable idea, by the way, to to product um, and, and enforcement. Um, it was a similar story with the with the Black and Decker Workmate. It took you know it took a long, long time for the product to go from sort of concept to various prototypes and iterations, and ultimately, you know, get something that's commercially viable. And then you start to see all the knockoffs and copyrights, uh, knockoffs and, and copiers. And going through all the litigation process to enforce that, so it can be very, very time-consuming and very long process. Not that's not to say that you shouldn't do it. It's just saying that you know, IP is an important piece, but it's it's time and, and determination that are going to help take you to the next level. Um, two other strategic considerations um, I want to think about is continuation patents, and I like these a lot, and I use these a lot for a lot of my clients. And it's a particular. Um, feature that's available in the United States, when you file an application in the US and it's granted, so ultimately the patent office decides you're entitled to your patent, you can refile the same application as a continuation. And the reason we like doing that is to keep the, the application pending because we can go back and then change the scope of the claims. And we've done this in a number of cases quite successfully. And I've had a number of cases go through litigation where you know, we start off with a claim that covers this particular feature of a product. And as we watch what our competitors are doing, uh, the one case in particular, it was in the automotive space and in the automotive welding, we became aware of a competitor that was selling a competing product. And it was a, um, a rotary cap magazine for changing welding tips. So they were selling effectively a complete carbon copy of what we were, we were selling in our product. We continued to go back to the patent office and were able to get a series of continuation applications to issue to patent to cover off different features of their products to go after them in litigation. And ultimately, we were successful in, in settling that for a very positive outcome for the client. But the reason we were able to do that was because we went back and refiled the continuations. That kind of addresses one of the things we talked about in one of the earlier slides. If the scope of your claims is too broad, you know, you're going to risk invalidity attacks. If it's too narrow, you're going to risk um, having people design around it. By keeping a continuation application pending, what you're able to do is to kind of massage those claims after the fact to focus on or target particular um, competitors. So it's a good way of keeping that in mind. And it's one of the tools we use when we talk about IP strategy more generally. Another one that we come back to all the time is what I call submarine patents. There was a question early on about trade secrets and the you know, the, the reality is when you file your patent, you are ultimately heading towards some sort of public disclosure. You can, however, file under a non-publication request in the U.S. And so this is a particular type of patent that allows you to keep that application uh, private for longer than 18 months. It'll stay secret for up to the life of the, of, until the patent is actually granted. One of the things that's, that's nice about this um, is that it allows you to um, continue to try to get the patent before you have to disclose the information. Uh, there's a question from Catherine about, will a continuation patent be within reach for startups, or is this a tool for bigger companies? Um, very good question. In fact, I often recommend it for a lot of startups, because what's nice about it is you've filed your application, you've got your patent approved, so you've gone through the fight with the patent office, you've got something of value, you can walk away, you're happy. The return on investment of filing a continuation is typically, you're typically looking at about 2000 bucks to file a continuation application, sometimes even less than that. And the potential is an entirely new patent that covers an entirely new scope of something. So your relative cost, you know, you probably are out, you know, frankly, in a, in a full application, anywhere from 10 to $20,000 from start to finish over a couple of years. For about 10% of the cost, you can go back to the patent office and start the process over again. So, for about a fraction of the cost, you can start. You can try to go after protection that's broader, and that might actually be more close to what a competitor is doing. So, it actually can be quite valuable in that sense. Um, obviously, we want to manage costs, and obviously, we want to be aware of that. But there's sometimes more value to be had in going after a good set of continuations in the United States. As opposed to filing, for example, I would rather see a company do that than file, you know, a lot of speculative claims over in Europe or in, in Japan if there's no interest in the market there, right? If you know that your main market for the next few years is going to be the U.S., you can really double down on the market and have a lot of success there. 
Catherine, did that answer your question? Or is there more about that you wanted to ask? Um, yeah, no, that, that's good. It, it's also, because it, it dovetails into, again, startups where time and money are in, in short supply. And I mean, of course, I always say, go talk to a patent specialist and they will help you with the strategy, but in terms of what are tools that they can realistically use, because as they're inventing something, it may not be fully hatched yet. They're still exploring, they're still varying it, and they're trying to run at 120 kilometers an hour. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's very, very true. And in fact, I would say that's probably normal. Like it's normal for, you know, when I see, especially, startups working they're moving so quickly that the stuff that we file an application we file today you know six months later the product is different or the technology is different it's moving much more quickly and it certainly moves quicker than the patent process so yeah that's, I, I that's a given yeah <laughs> You're right exactly yeah and the patent process can be notoriously slow you know mm -hmm. there are things we can do to speed that up but it, it's certainly not designed to be a, a two-week or two-month process um, in some cases not even a two-year process but that that is what it is um yeah, I, I think talking to someone who talks about IP strategy, it's one of the things that I like to do with my clients is, you know, how do we manage that balance of what's your spend, what's your focus? Even at an early stage from day one, I want to be thinking about that, right? Because sometimes the solution is not to spend much right now and to focus on things later or to focus on a very narrow, very narrow market. Let's just do the U.S. for now because maybe that's where your key market is and that's where you're going to get the most return. So. Yeah, and, and when do you put your stake in the ground to start the the first to file clock versus are you, are you advanced enough and is it going to change so much that that's going to then be meaningless? And it's always that juggling act. And I get asked. Yeah, absolutely. That <laughs> that's an act. Yeah, absolutely. And for me, I almost always try to work backwards from any public disclosure event. So yeah. at a minimum, before you're going to go public, let's get something on file. And then let's go backwards in time and maybe, you know, maybe you're a year away from public disclosure. Okay, maybe we're a bit too early now. So let's take a look at how, you know, what's the arc of your development and, and how, you know, how much is going to change between now and your public launch and how competitive is the environment, how fast are things moving? So it's, it's really a, a bespoke analysis. Every, every time we spoke, speak to clients, there are times where um, it's simple. We sort of can immediately predict what's going to happen. There's other times that often the case where, you know, you're trying to, to fit your your decision making to the facts that you have and what you have on the ground. It, it's often the case where you just have to figure it out as you go. And it's very sector specific too, because as you say, some sectors move really, really fast. Others, you might have a little bit more leeway and nobody has a crystal ball. That's exactly right, Catherine. I know for me, like I'm, I trained as a mechanical engineer. So, you know, a lot of the stuff that I've worked on early on in my career was slower moving. It was mechanical devices, machine parts, those kinds of things. And you could do, we did a lot of searching and it was fairly good because, you know, an 18 month blackout period, if the technology cycle is, you know, once every 10 years, things really turn over, it's still a pretty good assessment of what's out there. On the other hand, though, a lot of software stuff, we do a lot of, you know, cryptography, Bitcoin work, um, blockchain work these days. You know, you wait six months and the industry may have changed entirely. So that blackout period can have a real impact on your ability to search and also your ability, to, your sense of urgency, right? Like if, if you know that things are moving at a lightning speed, you may want to get something on file as quickly as you can, even though it's not fully fleshed out, because you know that if you wait too long, your window may be gone. Yeah, great. Well, thank you. It's, it's been really helpful. That's good. No, I appreciate it. Yeah, I'm happy to answer any questions offline as well. So if anything else comes up, don't hesitate to reach out. It's, it's, I enjoy these kinds of presentations because we do get a good dialogue going around interesting issues. So. Hey, thanks again. Great. Um, I've just got a couple more things I'll, I'll mention. So the, the other one I'd like to talk about is this, this clean room case study. And it's just, a, it's a local company. It goes back now a number of years, but um, the, there's a situation where um, there's a software company and the company, one of the companies had gone bankrupt and a former employee left that company, went to another company and started working on some code. And as part of that process, the person had brought some code with him from his original employer. So effectively some, and it was not necessarily critical, mission critical stuff, but there was enough of it that it kind of made its way into the ultimate product. Um, a, a larger multinational came in later on and said, well, I want to buy the startup for you know X million dollars. 
all of a sudden the the remains or the zombie of corporate A comes back and says, well, hang on a second. We know that there's some, we, we've done some analysis. We've seen that there's some code of ours in your product. And so we, we were now staking your claim on that deal and we're threatening to scuttle the whole deal. And ultimately a portion of the purchase price was directed back to the um, the original zombie corporation, which at that point, frankly, and I hate to say this, was probably just a bunch of bankruptcy lawyers trying to figure out what they could get for, for assets from the original corp. Um, but what what came out of me at this, um, you know, the lesson that I took away from this case study was it's a very important thing to have a clean room. When you have a, an employee leave and come into your organization, you know, it should be clean laptops. It should be, you know, you should not be working on personal laptop, uh, particularly if you were working on personal laptops for your previous employer, because you don't want any mixing of code. You want the code to be completely clean. You want it to be completely fresh. If they had any obligations to the existing company, you want to you want to vet those all up beforehand. You want to make sure that you know what were they working on, what did they take with them, and all of that gets left in the past. And so, you know, hard drives, laptops, USB keys, all that stuff, you know, they should really come into a clean environment with a with a fresh laptop and really no um, no holdovers from the old from the old world. It, it's becoming harder and harder to to police this because you know so much stuff is going online now and on the cloud and you know, everyone's using, you know, case things like Dropbox or iCloud to have documents floating around. And so how do you lock down and control people's access to things that they might have had in a previous employer when people's lights kind of carry with them in a way that we never had before? But it just sort of reinforces the importance of, of um, trying to maintain ownership of your IP and make sure that you have clear chain of title and chain of control over all of the stuff you're working on. Okay. And then the last slide I have is, a, is an interesting sort of example on obviousness. Um, this is a, this is, a, I always get this question about how do you know whether something is obvious or not? And the, uh, the example I like to use is this red office chair. And so um, obviousness is based on this question when we talk about patents, you know, is your technology different enough from everything that's been done before to be patentable? And the threshold there is not um, has someone else done the same thing? That's really a question of is it anticipated, but is the new thing different enough from old things that it sort of deserves or merits a patent? And I use this example to sort of illustrate one of the points that we talk about in the patent world. If your invention is a red chair, and you know people have been using black chairs or brown chairs for decades, but you're the first person to come up with the idea of putting a red fabric or red paint on the chair and coloring it red, and that's all it does, then you're not likely to have any success in getting that patent allowed because the patent office is almost certainly going to say that that patent is obvious. On the other hand, if you can establish with some data that there's something special that happens when you sit in a red chair, maybe your programmers are 10% more efficient or they stay awake 10% longer, you may be able to get a patent because you may be able to establish that there's something uh, unexpected or something surprising happening about that. And lest you think that this is actually a uh, sort of hypothetical without a real world example, there's actually been some research out of Europe that's proven, depending on the, the color of plates that you have or the color of cutlery, people will eat less. And so if they see red plates, for example, they tend to eat more. If they are eating off of blue plates, they will tend to eat less. So there's still a lot of work to be done in this space, but it's just an example of, you know, you can establish whether something is or is not obvious by attacking the preconceived notions about what something is and what something does. So the more you can establish that something is doing something unexpectedly, the better your chances are of going after something for obviousness or being able to establish something is not obvious, but is in fact worth a patent. So uh, that's it for me. I'm out of slides and I think I'm out of things to talk about unless there's any other questions or comments. Don't see any other uh, questions in the chat here, Jason. So. Um, I think that that concludes our session today. Um, Great. Thanks everyone for joining us um, and hope, uh, hope you all stay healthy and safe. Yeah, thanks very much. It was interesting. I enjoyed the questions and, and thanks for the discussion. Thanks again. It was a great, great session. Really useful. Yeah, thanks, Captain. Any questions, please don't hesitate. It was, a, it was always a pleasure. Okay, thanks. Okay. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Thanks, Jason. Thank you. Bye.